there's I um, so that's my email address if anybody has any questions on that works you can bring, jot that down or I can give you a card uh, after um, so let's see what are we going to talk about today um, so everybody every business has uh, things to say or, because if you don't tell anybody about what you do what you sell what your what your benefits are uh, you are not going to be very successful. You need to find a way to best communicate to your potential customers how it is that you are able to help them. You need to do that in a clear, effective way. Um, if you just kind of throw out a whole bunch of stuff, uh, it's either not going to get rid or people may not understand it or um, it, you just won't come up with the attention that uh, you're looking for in order to drive your business forward. So the first thing that you need to consider when you're doing any of this kind of marketing, spreading the word about your business, is really just start with your branding. Now, this is kind of a, a step that should happen before you're really doing any kind of advertising, but it really should only happen once because ideally you're putting together the solid foundation. Everything that you do going forward uh, should start from that, what happened? Okay, sorry. Start from that. Like, start from that brand. Uh, so what does that mean? So that means your business has a logo that uh, you use, and it has a, a couple of different styles for when you might be putting it in the newspaper. It might only get to be black, or you might, and you should have a color scheme that is consistent, and that you use the same colors all the time. That will have a direct effect on when we get into the, the graphic design. And topography. Uh, now, nowadays, most people, they buy a computer. You know, um, it's either a Mac or it's a Windows. It comes with, I don't know, 30, 40 fonts. And most people kind of think that, that those are the choices. Um, the only problem with that is, and there are some decent fonts in that list. The problem with that is, is that there's, if the whole world only has those 40 fonts and you pick one of them, it's going to be pretty easy for somebody else to do the same thing, and you can't really distinguish yourself by coming up with a specific style. Um, so you can purchase other fonts, and fonts can be cheap or they can be very expensive. Um, but I would encourage you to come up with one or two, or even one with a couple different styles, whether it be bold, italic. You kind of define that as your brand. So that going forward, when you're using all your, when you're doing all your marketing, um, you can use those fonts so that. Ideally, down the road, when you put out an ad or a flyer or anything, people will begin to recognize it before seeing your name or your logo on it, if you have that kind of a style. Apple does that very well. Um, Mercedes, you know, some of the other companies that really have a specific, you know, certainly these are big, giant budget companies. Um, but at the small business level, you can do the same kind of thing. The most important thing between all, uh, with all this is that you need to be consistent can't decide that this month I'm going to use these colors and that month I'm going to, next month I'm going to use these colors and I'm going to use these fonts and then I'm going to use these fonts. You know, you can do it, but you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. You'll get much more bang for the buck if you are that consistent and you start to develop something that people can then recognize. What's most often recognized is a color scheme. You know? And there's various companies that have worked that to the extreme. You can't really think of color brown nowadays without associating it with UPS. Um, used to be the Kodak yellow, but Kodak is kind of <laughs> floating around in that digital also. But we, they learned, were we learned in our last seminar that UPS actually has their color um, registered Correct. as a registered trademark. Yes. Huh. That's how potent that is. Wow. Well, there are very specific colors. Um, when you go and have something printed, uh, there are a couple different systems. Um, you may have heard from a printer or from somebody else about a Pantone color. And there are certain numbers. The Pantone colors are defined by certain numbers. And what those really are designed and where they came from is the printing press. So that inks are specifically designed to that color so that when you print with that ink, you know you are getting that color. And they set it up so that whether you're printing, because of which kind of paper you're printing it on uh, will cause some variability in that as well. Uh, but defining that color is a great place to start. Now, that is very much a print world idea because once you get into 
online. Um, how many people in here calibrate their monitor for color? Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Oh, okay. Well, not, no one, because I do. Well, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and my friend who's a medical illustrator does that, like, you know, on a regular basis. But, but you know, the other thing is, is that different manufacturers yeah. and how old is your monitor and all these different kinds of things have an effect on it. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't define a color, but at some point you lose control. Yep. And you do the best you can. Okay, so after you've got all this and now you have a, a, a foundation to work from, now we have to determine, okay, so for the particular piece that we're putting together right now, whether that be your brochure, your mm -hmm. website, your ad going into the local paper, who are we trying to talk to? Um, if you're trying to talk to him, your message is considerably different than if you're trying to talk to, you know, the CEOs at the Tech Expo downtown. And what it is that your business provides is going to determine exactly what that message is and who that audience is. Your style of writing, the pictures that you use, uh, how you lay things out, all, you need to consider that audience for all those things. You know, how sophisticated is your audience? How are you going to get that message across clearly? So, and now the last thing is exactly what is the message? You know, how do you want to word it? What are exactly the words? What's the offer you're trying to make? What's going to be the call to action? Uh, what is the real purpose of this specific piece that you're doing? And, and the more specific you can be, the more successful it's going to be. Um, but that can also be difficult, especially in a small business situation where you know, you had to drop that million dollar line item from your marketing budget. Um, Damn. <laughs> you know, because you want things to be able to have the most, you know, you want to be able to use things in multiple places, you want them to be able to kind of stretch them out and use them for, but at some point, the return on investment will diminish. If you are too big and too wide, you know, you're going to put in X dollars and not get anything back, whereas if you put in 2X dollars and you get 100% more response, then um, you end up in a much better place. Okay, so so what does, how do, what's graphic design, you know, what, how does that, once we have, let's say we have, we have our branding, we figured out our audience, we know what our message is, we've written a whole bunch of content and text, we know what we need to say. We can just kind of throw that on a page. Will anybody read it? That depends on the purpose. I'm going to guess a very small amount will if you just throw it on a page. So how can we make it, the idea is to make it easier for people to read it, for ideas to get across as quickly as possible. Um, the way that I do this when I'm designing is, I like to think of it as designing in layers. So you need to sort of engage people on a high level with just enough interest to bump them down to level two, which will hopefully generate enough interest to bump them down to level three, and so on. This does a couple things. It gets people to read more, or it gets people that might not have read at all to read something. It also is kind of a screening tool, because if people don't get all the way down to level two or level three, they probably aren't your audience and you're not going to, you know, you don't want to spend time selling or, or, or dealing with that audience. Um, but on the other hand, if there are people out there and you throw them a wall of text that they're not going to read, you know, whereas if you kind of layer it, and we'll see a little bit how this works when I get into some of the examples. You can get people, if you have a big page and you have a bunch of headlines at the top and each headline has you know, maybe a bullet or two underneath, and underneath that is a paragraph, there's your three levels, okay? You can read five or six headlines in a second to get the idea, and that will tell somebody whether they want to go to the next level. Oh, well, this, is, this bullet interests me. Okay, no, I'm gonna actually read this whole paragraph. You separate out the information. You can really get people to, to drill down, find what they're interested in, because they don't, you don't wanna waste their time, and they don't wanna waste their time either. So the tools that you have generally in a very kind of broad theoretical kind of level when we're doing this are, are these, these four simple ones. The proximity of things, the alignment of things, the repetition of things, and contrast. And so this little grid here that I've created 
does all that. So we have some contrast. Obviously, there's proximity where things are in relation to each other. We have the purple dots at the top, offset by the one at the bottom, the white ones crossing that. There's lots of different shapes. I can effectively move your eye around the page. I can decide what you're going to look at and what you're going to see first. That's the idea when you're putting together this message. What is it that you want people to see first? And after they see that, where does their eye go? If you don't give them any particular path, typically people just get confused and don't read it. That's what happens when you throw the wall of text. There's no clear way and it just is an overwhelming thing and they just push it off. But if you can kind of lead them down a the path, um, I think typically things become much more um, approachable and successful in, in getting that message across. Okay, so like I said, now we're gonna we're, we need to direct the eye. We'll start, <laughs> right? You know, like I said, if I want, you know, most people in this country or in this part of the world read left to right, top to bottom, in this direction. So if you just throw a wall of text at that, that's what they're gonna do. But from a graphic design standpoint, I can I can change that if I want. I can decide that you're gonna look somewhere else. I can create motion on a page going right across. Okay. I can create, make you go in circles on the page. And if that's what you're trying to, if that's going to serve your purpose, then think about those kinds of things. Again, I'm intentionally being a little bit vague because it goes back to all those other questions that I need to answer first. Who's the audience? What are you trying to do? So now that I've got a message and I've directed the eye around the page, I, I can effectively deliver the message that way. So. When you're putting out one of these pieces, if you've done your job all the way around for a specific message, it could and should have the same effect as if you could stand up in front of a room and give that presentation to those people every time you hand out your brochure, every time they come to your website, every time they see your newspaper ad. Okay, so now I've given you all this kind of general theoretical kind of stuff about how to go about this. Where a lot of people, especially in the small business space, tend to run into trouble is when we get to this part of it, because there's a lot of technicals that you may or may not be able to control um, due to skill, budget, whatever. Um, but you should at least be aware of them, and that way, going forward, you can try to figure out, is this something that I can can and should invest some time and or dollars into. Um, and what it's going to come down to, certainly, is if you have the best message in the world, but you give out something that looks like, you know, your niece from high school, sophomore <laughs> class did it, you know, you may not be getting the best out of the money that you're putting into that. Keep spending this around. Okay, so let's just start, first of all, with color. So if we look at this whole big giant shape, that's all the colors that the human eye can see. This yellow line, those are all the colors that can be displayed on a, on a computer monitor. And finally, this little blue space is the colors that we can print effectively. Hmm. It's the smallest space. Um, and it's, but it does have a couple of different things that can't be displayed on a computer screen. But most people look at their computer screen, they put their thing together, and they decide, this is great, I'm gonna send it off to the printer. And then they get it back to the printer and they say, this looks kind of blah, all my colors are now like, you know, desaturated, and it's not what I thought. Well, you know, we've got two completely opposite color systems. We've got electricity shining light at you, which is gonna be bright, because there's no other way around it. And then we've got ink on paper. There's no electricity. And there's no shininess. Um, so, so if you go to a printer, that's where the CMYK comes from. When you print something, you're using cyan, magenta, yellow, and black inks. And that's a, that's a it's called a subtractive color method. So, put all those together. If you mix all four of those together, you get black. On a computer screen, we use red, green, and blue light. If you mix all those together, you get white. Totally opposite. The opposite. It's additive and subtractive. 
Um, both, like I said, are different sets than what your eye can see. So, knowing about this and then doing something about it is where the challenge is. So, again, if you're gonna, if you're trying to put together an online ad or a website, you know, do the best you can and don't worry so much about it if it looks at least acceptable on your screen um, and you're happy with it, go with that because no matter what, there's going to be people out there that are going to see it differently and you really have no control of that. That happens all the time when I'm designing websites. Uh, I put together something and you know it looks great on my nice fancy calibrated monitor and the client is using a four-year-old Windows laptop that has, that was maybe, you know, one of the economy uh, models, and the colors, you know, look okay if they look this way, but if they turn the monitor this much, now they're off, and you know, there's only, you know, so much you can do. You do it, um, but there are certain colors certainly that work, and it's it's the web gets better every day, really almost it's almost that fast. And back when we first started ten years ago, and the large majority of people had graphics cards in the machine that could only show you know, 256 colors. Yeah. You know, that's where they used to have those web safe colors, if you ever heard that term before. Um, and that was just, that was hard because those weren't very attractive, 256 colors either. <laughs> so it's better now because technology comes and things are cheaper and whenever you buy a computer you have something that at least can show you some decent color. Okay, so the next thing is resolution. So when you go to print something, when they print, what you ideally need to have are images that are 300 dots per inch. Now, all, fixing all these things, making things, whether they're RGB color or CMYK color, and making things 300 DPI or 100 DPI, all this requires software. Um, sorry, but Word doesn't do any of it, and it doesn't do what it does well either. <laughs> Word only works in RGB color, so if you bring an image, it's an RGB color. So if you go to your printer and you print a Word file, it's going to be what it's going to be, and it's they're going to try to fix it, but chances are, you know, the translation isn't. If you're looking, you know, if you're small business and you want something that's close, okay, fine. Um, if you're really, like I said, if you pick a Pantone color and you're trying to get your branding right, you want to be consistent and spot on all the time, you can't use Word because it's not going to ever be. Um, so the other thing you might have heard from your printer is that they want like an EPS file or a vector graphics file or an Illustrator format file. That's because there's two kinds of things that, are, that can be drawn on a computer screen. And there's the, the raster files, which means that, you know, there's little squares all over on the screen or on a print or dots, whether you, however you want to call them. Oops, sorry. And in a raster file, they are set. You have a exact number of them, and they eat, every single one of them is a specific color. And you can get um, gradations of color by using varying colors across a transition, and that's how you get photographic um, images. The problem is, is that when you then try to make those bigger, you're telling the computer, um, okay, I need to make these bigger, so you need to fill in some pixels. Can you just guess about, because based on what's around, and then and the computer will. And they've gotten certainly much better at that. Mm -hmm. Then you start to get this, all this kind of fringy stuff that happens. So if you've ever gone and taken a, hey, this is a cool image I found on the web, or a picture of me on my website to take that and I'm going to go try to print it, it's going to look jaggy. It's kind of the technical term. Because <laughs> um, it, just, it just wasn't designed that. One, it was an RGB color because it was on a screen, and two, it's a low resolution. So um, you're kind of starting off right off the bat, and things get compressed on the web, so the smallest file size. So you have like three strikes against you before you even start if you're taking images off the web. Vector, on the other hand, um, is it entirely mathematical? The computer calculates these lines every time. So if I have a circle, and then I make the circle a thousand times bigger, the circle, the computer just recalculates it, and it's perfect again. So 
So I can make that as big or as small as I want. This is why logos, flat color graphics, um, you can do some other fancy stuff. But, um, you don't ever get a vector photograph because it just can't, it just can't reproduce the color transitions the way a JPEG file or a real image file or a raster file. But if you ever get a logo professionally designed, or even just get it from Staples or wherever you get it from, you really should try, if at all possible. If you get it designed from a professional designer, they'll give you the vector version. I always give out, you know, a CD or all the files that I have. Um, if you don't have that, you're you're kind of you're starting off again from a position of disadvantage. <coughs> that would be the first thing. I'd make sure you have that vector. I said, you know, I can draw all kinds of things. And, and type is also, when you type something, whether it be Word or whatever you use it, type is always vector. That's why there are fonts. Those font files give all the vector shapes for all the letters in that particular font. Hmm. So that why, that's why you can also make type huge on a page or small, and you can use all the different type sizes, and it doesn't matter because it's going to just, the computer's going to recalculate the shapes exactly, which is also why good fonts cost money. A, a, a designer actually went and drew, hand drew all those specific mm. shapes and the fonts, the better fonts today, which are called open type fonts that have, they have something like 200 and something characters in them. Not just, there's uppercase, lowercase, there's all the different symbols, all the different kinds of stuff that goes into a font file. So if you have the right color, the right resolution. Again, all these things, it depends on where you're going. If you if you know you're only going to put an online ad, don't worry about it. You know, whether it's vector or raster, because it's going to be online. It's going to be on, you know, the computer's going to display it. It's when you get into print that you need to worry about what's happening here. Okay, so let's start with some example. I got two things. <laughs> Steve gave me something last week. Uh, and this is his brochure. So this is, you know, it's a trifold brochure. This is the inside of it. So if you were to open it up, you see this. Mm -hmm. And this is the outside of it. So this is the, the cover you can see. This is the back. And this is the flap that comes over. Okay. So the first disclaimer <laughs> is that what I'm going to show is in, with us, this is the one thing about design. It's entirely subjective. I mean, I will explain the reasons why I did stuff. You may or may not agree. That's fine. Yeah. I these when I was doing these projects, I had here's a redesign, potential redesign of the outside front part of it. Now I'll tell you the, the thought process behind it and why I did certain things. Um, for this brochure, I tried to stick pretty close to the format that Steve already had. Um, if a client comes to me and they said, I want a new WYSI, or, you know, widget, whatever it may be, um, I might typically first decide whether it's even in the format, the best format that it could be or should be. And when I show the next example, I actually did change it. So we'll see um, what you think of that. Um, and the other thing that works across design with most things is the KISS principle. Everybody knows what that is? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Okay. So, the, where I took that same shape and made it, you know, one of the predominant elements on the back here. So, if you're just looking at the back of this brochure, you can go and make that point about, I tell you where your eye goes. And so if you're just looking at the back, it goes, right? Mm -hmm. We've got, you know, there's that big black spot there that draws it immediate attention. But then the whole thing forces you down just because of that image. And then we get right to the contact information, which is one of the first things that people are looking for. Um, the list that you had, you know, again, like I said, it was just a kind of. You have problems. I got one. Yeah, I had one, and then I don't know what happened. But if you want to pass it around to people. And, uh, if you guys, you know, 
this is kind of interactive at this point because it's interesting for me to hear what you guys think. I've done this seminar before and I've had people vehemently, vehemently disagree with me on what I said. And that's good. That's fine. Because I like stuff too. But I want to see, uh, you know, do people find it a little bit difficult to read some of that contrast? That was kind of my main mm -hmm. thing that I would fix it all. Um, now, we get to Lois. Lois, what do you Oh, okay. So now going to the to the inside, this one here. This to me gets into the overwhelming wall of text because there's no it's, there's got a, there's a couple different fo there's really three focal points because you have the three columns okay that have a, like if you kind of squint your eyes and you just kind of see blotches of color you'll see the three columns okay but they're all equal in weight so it doesn't you kind of don't know where to go first mm -hmm. and so really your only choice is to read it all <clears throat> which is can be overwhelming and prevent people from reading any for that reason okay. the other thing that i find a lot is that when people do is that okay so yes it's a three column brochure but when you open it it's one piece of paper but somehow people kind of get stuck in that it's three columns. There's no reason for you to stick with three columns. I mean, yes, that doesn't mean I don't take the folds into consideration because it will look a certain way. But on the other hand, there's nothing that says you can't go across columns. Okay. So what I've done here is Really just simplify. Okay. And now it has a much more like I might come to this side first and then come across. Because the pictures of the graphic kind of stuff typically mm -hmm. tends to draw people's eye. But then I also like to do things which it's harder to see here, but um, again, when we get into the text and that layers of design, okay. So we have, you know, the logo is its own kind of style and is the biggest, the top. But this is kind of, like, this really, to me, is the whole point of the brochure, right? That's, that's the whole message, right? We do, you know, all the rest of this stuff is important, but it's the specifics, you know? Because most people, if they have any kind of artwork or they, you know, they need frame, you know, they know what framing is. So it's not like it's a technical term. And sometimes people, I see that a lot too, is that clients are so into their own business and the, the technical terms and the jargon and they talk and, you know, they just don't realize that the person across that they're talking to has no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I decided that this one, just for something different, whether I would do this for sure, I don't know. I mean, if it, it would depend on, you know, again, working with the client, whether they really felt they wanted to or whether they didn't. Sometimes I might, we have this discussion, I might show them a quick mock-up to see. But this one, I totally changed the format because I thought it would be nicer and work better. And so I chose a six by nine kind of postcard. It's still one sheet, no folds. Um, I didn't really set it up to be mailed. I set it up, I set it up to be the same as this so that you could just hand it around. Um, I don't think, do people mail things anymore? Mm -hmm. It's coming back. <laughs> the post office wants you to. Well, of course. <laughs> so, again, so here's the front, and here's the kind of what we're starting with. And, whoops. Okay, so let's start with the front of the card. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Six 
size. Okay, so now I have something that, like the line, breathes. <laughs> okay, um, and it hits the big thing. I mean, wine making shop is now, I didn't really make it appreciably bigger, but it's got, again, more breathing room. It's easier to find. You see it. Okay, so you can kind of see what that is right away. You know that it's wine right away because of all what's going on on that side. Uh, and then this is kind of their whole thing, your wine, right? And there's a little bit in here about kind of, you know, but again, you see this, that, and then, then where this might have been a certain amount of, you know, too much to read. Um, if you see this other stuff, now it's only four lines. And you can also see that um, the space between lines is called the letting. And I spread it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make it too big. You don't want to make it too small. But there's right and not right. And those are not always the same amount. <laughs> but, you know, it just, you kind of get a feel for this over time. So, like another typo, see, you got me. Uh, I would put the space in there. But, uh, well, I should have, I would have, because I did. Um, but it just kind of, it opens up the text a little bit more again. It's just kind of like, I can kind of see what's going on here. And it gives me enough information to decide whether I'm interested or not. And that's all. Not everything. Just enough to say, hey, wow, what's on the back? Instead of, oh yeah, thanks, there you go. <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> right? So, you add a ton of information on the back or on, on both sides actually. And so if we then go to the back, okay, now we have our location and phone number real big, real easy to find across the bottom. A much sim more simplified map. Okay. If you feel you need to have the map, you know, again, most people don't have the software or the drawing that I have and so copy and paste into Google Map is perfectly understandable. However, it doesn't always look, you know, it doesn't match your brand. Um, you know, it's going to show all kinds of stuff that's irrelevant. You know, I kind of, you can't, because if I make this bigger, you can see that. Okay, so you can read the major roads you need to read. See where it is. You know, mm -hmm. and you can get there from that map without all the stuff that Google put in. Mm -hmm. um, again, he had a considerable bit of repetition on the front and back of what the text said. So I kind of honed it down into, you know, I, I just said it once really in three places. So this is kind of this the introduction. You know, we have this comfortable setting. We have the equipment. We can help you do all this cool stuff if you're interested in wine. You know, here, this goes into a little bit more of the process. Again, this is a lot of text here. You may or may not want to read it. But if you read this, then you say, okay, well, you know, maybe I will. And then looking at this now, there's more stuff I could do to this. I would call out the four choices more because there's four main categories of the different. Mm -hmm. What they what they do is they buy the juice from various vineyards that do all the it says in here that they're the experts at pressing and destemming. Um, but then what they get, the reason that they can guarantee that you're gonna like your wine and the product is guaranteed is that they get a guaranteed product from the vineyard. So but Again, I chose, um, now I've also put it on kind of that wood background, like the mm -hmm. wine barrels. Um, I've chosen a font that's a little bit more kind of, this particular font I feel has a little bit of a old English kind of, not fully mm -hmm. old English, that's hard to read, but it's just got that old kind of almost medieval or whatever sort of styling to it, which, you know, the aging of wine. And again, these are all my sort of opinions and assumptions that I make when I'm designing whether I would make the same ones working with a client, you know, we would, there would be discussions about that. I would say this is what I think. 
a lot of times they say fine or no, I don't want it this way, whatever. He never listens to me then about the chamber. I think that's the other way around. <laughs> oh my. He never listens to you about the book. the chamber marketing. <laughs> I get these walls of text that say, isn't this great? <laughs> yeah. You want me to open he one of those? I got one of those on here. He <laughs> fixes everything for us. Uh, <clears throat> anybody have any thoughts, insights, and opinions on this design? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I really like it. I think the vintner's circle and then the winemaking shop, like you said, is, it's much clearer. And it's still very upbeat. Um, and it kind of gives the coloring and the wood background gives a feeling of warmth. Um, this is, I don't know why, but I would put the choices first in the Vintner Circle last to the right because I would want to, it seems like it would go in that order. That would be the natural flow. First you choose your wine, then what wine you're going to make, then you make it. And now I want to go there. So I would tend to put this part, just switch choices in Bittner's circle. Just out of curiosity, what does everyone else think of that? I'd get rid of the choices completely and put a really nice image of someone drinking wine or... Right. Mm -hmm. the well, what the about, what about that ordering of the information as it is? I like the order. I think it's almost a welcoming there, and then you get into the body of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, plus you have to go there and find out how you make the wine and make your choice. So you sort of, it's more like a, to me when I think of it, you'd have to go there first. <laughs> well, yeah. Now, you know, like I said, doing, doing these, um, I paid little to no attention to exactly what the content was. Mm -hmm. I mean, obvious things, but, you know, yes, I would have a lot more to say in the discussions to say, well, you know, if you want to say this, maybe we should say that. I get that, especially on the web, because people are like, I just need a three-page website. No, you don't. So I like the simplicity <laughs> of it. I like that you've taken um, a format. We all sort of think, okay, it's a vertical postcard. It needs to be a vertical, you know, form. It needs to be done vertically. And you've shifted it and made it horizontal. You've broken it up into different pieces that do draw your, you know, it makes it easier. It actually, I feel a little more relaxed when I see the work. Mm -hmm. it, it, this, I you almost can get, I, well, <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. yeah. well, I almost get stressed. Like when I saw Steve's brochure, it almost stressed me out and mm -hmm. I had to like close it up and hand it off. <laughs> because there's just too, too much, much. Too you know? Too so it, and I'm like, I don't want to read all that. And it's, I, I it's almost, you know, kind of a repulse kind of <laughs> 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 Because I do get sort of stressed, so it's like I want to hand it off and get rid of it, rather than it's not inviting. You just lost a memory. Take more than that to drag me away. So to have, you know, for in the example of the frame shop, to see it, I was much more, I could almost feel myself relax when you showed that other image. It was like, wow, that's much gentler. So that was terrific. And this is the same. You make it, you know, you when you now when I look at the brochure or look at it, you don't have to do it the way it's sort of laid out. You can do some other things. Which also is different and it catches your attention and you know you holds know, your attention for that extra moment. The interesting thing is that Lou took a trifold and made it open mm -hmm. and and Lay it, lay it out as a single sheet, and he took a single sheet and made it lay out with a trifold. And it worked better in both cases. In both cases, yeah. right. That was the interesting thing. I just say, I, I love to hear things like, oh, I just wanted it done well on the other side, and the map on the other side. It's just, you know, that's <laughs> yeah, my I mean, job. Yeah. You know, my job is to, you know, try to figure out what people are going to think yeah. and react and how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, this is a, a joke when I worked at this place way back. Um, you know, you get those cards in the mail, and you have to fill them out for their like, you know, marketing or catalog or stuff, and they ask for your title. One of the one of the ones I put, Master of Time and Space, <laughs> and they actually called me. <laughs> I don't know. So, but I mean, that's what it is. Though. I was like, I put the map where I wanted it. You know? Yeah. Maybe. You know, in this case, I can't really say, but I might do something intentionally to, you know, flip the way yeah. your mind works. Because 
it's going to make you think differently, which is what we're trying to do. Right? I, can, I can basically insert, you know, jumble text, and it will throw in a whole bunch of Latin. Or maybe some, yeah. Yeah. And it just, because it doesn't, when, at, at my point, you know, to do, once you get to the graphic design, it doesn't matter what the text is to a certain extent. It does, because I have to, you know, make headlines and all that. But for the sake of what I'm showing here today, it's a yeah. <laughs> so I, I did a quick proof on it, but I didn't. Because <laughs> those things bother me too. But. <laughs> does anybody have any other general questions about any part of any of this stuff? So what, where's a good source for fonts online? If you want, you know, a good source, because you, if, you, if you just search for fonts, you get a million different websites and you can go get them. But what's a reliable, reputable source? Well, fonts? if you want, you, you can buy it from Adobe. Um, they're typically going to be pricier, but they're the best font. Um, what the font is a good place? I actually use a lot. This is family. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I do this because um, I use this actually a lot because I'm going to see if it's going to come up on the network here. But you can upload an image yep. and it will tell you what the font is. Oh, that's it's good. pretty good. That's good. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then if it doesn't, yeah. You can say consult an expert, and it kind of gets thrown out to a form, and, then you, and you know it's not immediate five right. seconds, but it might be within an hour Someone or two. Then. In, yeah. Now, then comes the question: Do you have the font? Because yeah. probably not. Pro yeah. Do I have the font? I mean, it's possible. I have over sixty-five hundred fonts right. on my machine. Right. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of fonts. Yeah, and you know, but like so, that's like I have bought some. But you also get a ton from, like if you buy Illustrator, InDesign, if you buy the Adobe suite, it might come with 200 fonts. Right. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Lou. That was great. Thank you.